Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning and welcome to FaithBridge. It is great to see all of you here today, whether you are in uh, Klein Campus, Center Court East or West, or if you're up at the Woodlands, or if you're coming to us online, we're glad that all of you have chosen to worship at FaithBridge today. As Sully mentioned a few moments ago, we are in the final message of our sermon series that we've been calling Rise Above. And uh, we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter to guide our thinking throughout this series. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter. You'll find that toward the end of the New Testament. If you need a Bible in all of our locations, just raise your hand. Ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one, and that can be yours to keep if you have that need. Today, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and put your finger there as a place marker, we'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, let's uh, take a moment and pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege that is ours to gather in this place today in perfect freedom, with no fear whatsoever, to lift up the name of Jesus, to sing his praises, to acknowledge his lordship over our lives, and to be equipped to go out and to serve him. We pray now as we turn our attention to your word, your Holy Spirit would come, as you promised, to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So it occurs to me that there are some things in life that can only be truly enjoyed when you're 14 years old. And certainly at the top of that list of things would be that time-honored youth activity known as a lock-in. Now, for the uh, uninitiated among us, if you don't happen to know what a lock-in is, imagine 50, 50 50-plus junior high kids literally locked in to a church building for an all-night party. Sounds like a real treat, doesn't it? (laughs) Back in the day when I was 14, I was all about it. It's a great, great time. Today, though, If I were given a choice, I really think I would rather be locked up than to be (laughs) locked in. I remember one lock-in in particular from my childhood, notable for something that took place about halfway through the night. We were engaged in a game of dodgeball in the church fellowship hall. And one of the uh, adult chaperones who was unfortunate enough to be there that evening was playing the game with us. His name was Dennis. He was actually our our worship leader for the evening. And it it was a a pretty fierce game, lots of movement and activity. And at one point, Dennis uh, somehow or another lost his footing, slipped, and cracked his head on the hard tile floor of that fellowship hall. I mean, he, he hit it really hard. You could hear it ricochet around the room. And he developed what would prove to be the only actual case of amnesia that I have ever personally witnessed. When he came to, finally, he did not know who he was. He didn't know where he was, what was going on, nothing. It was all a big blank for him. And as you might imagine, all of the adults who were there that evening were absolutely terrified that he had perhaps done some real damage to himself. My buddies and I, on the other hand, thought it was about the coolest thing we'd ever seen in our lives. And I seem to remember scheming with them about ways we could mess with his mind while he was in this state of of unforgetfulness. It's true. If an individual just happens to get hit on the head just the right way, I suppose, in just the right circumstances, you really can forget who you are. I've observed, though, over the years that... That's not the only kind of amnesia we can suffer. There's another kind of amnesia out there. And it does not have so much to do with uh, our name, forgetting our location, things of that nature, as much as forgetting things like uh, values. 
beliefs, spiritual truths that at one point in time we held most dear. And this kind of amnesia does not uh, occur because of a, a quick development, something that happens rather suddenly, like a, a blow to the head. No, this sort of amnesia comes about over a long, slow progression, a progression of compromises, of perhaps bad choices, changes in environment, changes in thinking that ever so slowly over the years take us from being one kind of person to ultimately becoming someone else altogether, someone completely different. Someone who really looks back on a a, a former way of thinking as being kind of dated and strange and old-fashioned. Why would I ever think that way? And this individual begins to engage in uh, practices, uh, beliefs, thought patterns, what have you, that perhaps at another point in their life really would have been unimaginable, unthinkable even. You see, if we are not careful, if we do not choose to remember who we are, the world has a way of shaping, molding, fashioning us according to its own designs. Like, like a fish that really has no idea that it is wet, we can become so deeply immersed in a particular culture, society, lifestyle, that the shaping forces that are exerted upon our lives, our thinking, and our values, we hardly even notice. And over time, we suddenly find ourselves a very, very different person. Throughout this series that we've been calling Rise Above, we've been talking about how to rise above those shaping and molding influences, how to retain our unique character as followers of Christ. And some 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Peter was engaged in the same task. As he wrote his letters called First and Second Peter, He was trying to help that little flock of believers rise above their particular situation and the shaping and molding influences that were working upon their lives at that particular time. Today we're going to be looking, as I said, in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Peter wrote these words. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a temple, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Now, admittedly, this is a rather uh, difficult passage of Scripture to understand, to fully interpret. Uh, Peter uses a variety of terms, phrases, images, that really are quite foreign to our modern-day non-Jewish ears. Terms like Zion and priesthood and temple and stones and 
cornerstones and things of that nature. They just really do not communicate directly to us. But to his original readers, who were primarily Jewish, of course, they made total sense. Because these sorts of things were a part of everyday life for your typical Jew. Zion, or Jerusalem as it is also known, is the most significant city for any Jew back then and still today. A sacred city. And the most important site in Jerusalem, in Zion, was the temple. A magnificent stone structure, very ornate and very, very sacred. It was in the temple where the presence of God dwelt, where the formal worship of God would take place, where animals were sacrificed to cover the sins of the Jewish people, the only place where sacrifices could be made. And the men who worked inside of the temple were the priests, chosen, special, set apart for a particular task to perform the duties and responsibilities of the temple, to offer the sacrifices, and above all, to serve as intermediaries between God and His people. No doubt about it. In Jewish life, the temple was the most sacred site. One day, though, about, oh, 30 years or so before Peter wrote this letter... Peter and Jesus and the other disciples were walking through Jerusalem and they came upon the temple. And the disciples were uh, taken with its majesty, with its magnificence. And they pointed that out to Jesus. They said, Lord, look at this building. Isn't it amazing to behold? Just look at the massive stones. Look at the ornate handiwork, the carvings, the decorations. Aren't they magnificent? Jesus, however, was rather nonplussed by the whole thing. And to the the shock, and I'm sure somewhat to the dismay of his disciples, he said, guys, uh, let me tell you something. This thing isn't as great as you're making it out to be. As a matter of fact, not too very far into the future, not one stone is going to be left upon top of the other. This thing is going to be demolished. This is not where God lives This is not the true temple of God. I am the temple of God. If you want to know where God lives, if you want to know who God is, look at me. If you want to be connected to God, be connected to me. I am the temple, not something made by hands, not certainly not something of stone, but me, Jesus Christ. I am the living temple. I'm sure that... 30 years later, when Peter got around to writing these words that we just read, he had that conversation in the back of his mind. And in this passage, he is essentially saying to both the original readers and to us, look, if you call yourself Christian, if you are connected to Jesus, then you are a part of the temple of the living God, the one who is God, the one who represents the presence of God. And not only that, you are a priest in that temple. You are a representative of Jesus to the world. You are one of the intermediaries between him and the rest of the world. You have been chosen. You are special. You are a holy nation. You are different. You are set apart. Therefore, be different. Don't give in to the sinful desires that wage war against your soul, that would bring pressure and influence to bear upon your character. But instead, be who you are. Remember who you are. Now, why this overwhelming emphasis on identity? Why is Peter so concerned that those readers and us today remember who we are in Jesus Christ. Why was that a big deal for him? Well, two reasons. The first, rather self-evident, I think, it's what we've been talking about up to this point. We have to remember who we are so that we can be who we are. That we don't give in to the pressures and influences of the world. That we don't give in to the sinful desires that wage war against our souls. That rather, we live the life that Christ has called us to live. That we be the special holy nation, the covenant people that he has called us to be. That's the first reason. But there's a second reason. 
why Peter makes such a big deal about our identity. And that, that's where I want us to spend the rest of our time together this morning. This second reason is easy to just jump right over if we're not careful. It's not quite as self-evident as the first. And it's important to know this second reason because it communicates to us a very significant spiritual principle. I want to give to you the, the principle first, and then we'll go back and look at its biblical basis. And the principle is this. When we forget who we are, we forget what we are supposed to be doing. When we forget who we are, we forget what we are supposed to be doing. Look with me at verse 9. Verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? So that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. In other words, we have been chosen. If we name the name of Jesus Christ, if we proclaim that He is our Lord and Savior, if we call ourselves Christian, we have been chosen not only for our own sakes, not only for our own gatherings, but rather we have been chosen for those who are not here, for those who are still in the darkness, who have not yet heard the good news of the gospel. One time we were in the darkness. We were the ones who were trapped in sin and in death and in facing an eternal life without God. But now we have received the good news, and now we have been chosen, and it is incumbent upon us, the calling upon our lives is to be the ones who call forth, who sing forth the glorious praises of the one who brought us out of that darkness and into the light. We aren't to stay here, my friends. We've been saved to go back and find those who still have not heard the truth. But when we forget who we are, we forget what we're supposed to be doing. It's been 10 years now that I have been uh, privileged, blessed to serve as the missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. And, and I really do count it among the greatest blessings of my life. Sometimes I still wake up and just pinch myself that I get to do what I get to do. And as you might imagine, over that 10-year period, I, I've given a lot of thought to this task that we've been given, this responsibility, this mission that we have to go back into the darkness and call people into the light. And there's a question that, that comes around very regularly in my thinking, haunts me, if you will. And the question is this, why is it taking so long to get the job done? Jesus gave us the responsibility 2,000 years ago. Why, why have we not finished? Why haven't we completed the work that he called his people to do? I don't think it has anything to do with personnel, with manpower, so to speak. I mean, today, over 2 billion people in this world self-identify as Christians. That's over a third of the world's population. If every single one of us just led two people to Christ in our lifetime, we'd have the job done like that. So it's not as though there's not enough of us. Nor do I think it is due to a lack of resources. No, that, there is quite enough money right here in the United States alone to bring about the evangelization of the whole world. It's not a lack of money. It's not a lack of resources. It's not a lack of manpower. What is the problem then? Today, there are more churches, denominations, organizations, mission-sending agencies than ever before. Our ability to communicate is greater. It is unparalleled in human history. Telecommunication has shrunk the world. It is smaller than ever with regard to communication. With the telephone, television, internet, we can contact just about anyone anywhere on the planet but why aren't we getting the job done? What is the problem? Well, it's a big problem. It's a big task. And I'm sure that there are probably several answers to that question. 
But I'm equally sure there is one answer that I can tell you about today. Too many of us, far too many of us, have forgotten who we are. And as a result, we have forgotten what we're supposed to be doing. The world has taken our attention. We've become preoccupied with this and that. And things have gobbled up so much of our thinking power and our time and our energy and our money and everything else that we have that suddenly the fact that we belong to Jesus, the fact that he has given us a task to do, has fallen further and further and further back into the recesses of our minds. We've forgotten who we are. And as a result, we've forgotten what we're supposed to be doing. In about two months, on March the 30th to be exact, my wife Becky and I will celebrate being married for 20 years. It's hard to believe just how fast it has gone by. And certainly, I'm aware that uh, there are people among us who've been married much, much longer than that. But still, no matter how you slice it, 20 years is a long time to do most anything. But despite the fact that I've been married for 20 years, I've had 20 years of practice at being a husband, I still, from time to time, forget that I'm a husband. And as a result, I forget to do the things that husbands are supposed to do. Now, it's not that I am consciously unaware of the fact that I'm a husband. I, if you were to ask me, yes, I would quickly tell you, certainly I am married to Becky Slagle. I've got a ring here on my hand to remind me. And it's not that I've uh, ever gone back to living like I were single. That's certainly not the case either. So what do I mean when I say sometimes I forget that I'm a husband? Well, I love my job. I love my work. I love the people that I work with. I love the tasks that we've been called to do. And I can get so focused on my work that I forget that I should be giving to Becky as her husband at least as much time as I give to my job, if not more. I can get so enamored doing things that I enjoy doing, certain pastimes like riding my bike, painting, wood carving, reading. I can get so taken up with doing those sorts of things that I forget to do the things that Becky needs me to do as a husband. Now, you ladies will find this one next to impossible to believe. But sometimes I can get so focused on a football game <laughs> or a television show or a commercial for that matter <laughs> that I can forget that Becky is sitting right next to me. And in the last 30 seconds, she might have actually asked me a question I can get so wrapped up in my needs, my wants, my desires that I can forget that Becky, as my wife, has needs, wants, and desires of her own. And my responsibility as her husband is to meet those. When we forget who we are, we forget what we are supposed to be doing. When is the last time that you consciously thought about who you are in Jesus Christ, remembered that you are special, that you are chosen, that you are a holy priesthood, a holy nation called forth to sing his praises and bring people who are in darkness into the light. When was the last time that you remembered that? What is standing in your way? What is causing you to forget who you are? Is it your job? Do you love your work so much? Are you so caught up in pursuing a career that your identity in Christ has drifted off into the Netherlands somewhere, somehow? Is it the pursuit of comfort and wealth? Lord knows we've got a lot of it here in the United States, and it can occupy all kinds of time trying to get more of it for me and mine. Is that what's making you forget? Is it a relationship? 
Is it a hobby? Is it a goal, the pursuit of some goal? Is it sin? Is there something in your life, even today, that you know, you know, you know, you know is not supposed to be there? You don't have to open your Bible and read it. You don't need a preacher to tell you. You just know God does not want this here, and yet it abides, and it's tolerated, and it stays, and as a result, you're separated from God, and you can't hear His voice. It's not that He isn't speaking But sin has plugged your ears. You've forgotten who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. Or is it that perhaps you've just grown cold to the things of God? It's not necessarily sin. It's not the pursuit of something else. It's just things of God don't matter much anymore. And what once was a brightly burning fire of love and enthusiasm, not only for God, but for people who don't know God, has now become embers and ashes. And the smoke that rises from those embers and ashes are a perfect picture of the haze of amnesia that has taken hold of your spiritual life. What is causing you to forget? What is that thing? And we all have something. Whatever it is, I want to challenge you today to rise above, to wake up, to shake off the fog of amnesia and be reminded, I'm not just anybody and I'm not just somebody. No, I am someone who belongs to Jesus Christ. I am someone who has been saved by his blood, who has been given the gift of eternal life, and who has been given the task of going back into the world, back into the darkness, to people who have not heard, and singing forth the praises of the one who saved me, and leading them into the light. I'm challenging you today to remember this is not our party. This party is for those who aren't here yet. It's by the grace of God that we are here, and the only acceptable response to that grace is to wake up and go back and get those who aren't here. Have you forgotten who you are? And have you forgotten the task that God has called you to? Let me remind you, friends, He has every expectation that we are going to be about it. And there is going to come a day in your life and in mine when we will stand before Him and He will ask, what did you do for me? And what did you do for the lost? And what will be your answer? Now, there are some folks who've been listening to what we've been talking about, and it has 100% teetotally resonated with your heart. And all you need is for someone to fire the starting gun, and you are off to the races. You can't be held back. But I suspect that there is a much larger group of people here today who would agree with what I've been saying And maybe you've felt just a little bit inspired by what I've been saying. But Pastor Dan, you think, what what would I do? What would I do? Where would I go? What what is it? How, How would I live that out? Well, have no fear. Because your missions ministry is here. Do you know why the missions ministry exists at Faithbridge? It's not to give me a job. I can assure you of that. It is to look for. It is to create. It is to provide. It is to place before you opportunities to exercise your God-given gifts and your God-given responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we have more than enough avenues, more than enough opportunities to keep every single person who darkens the door of our church busy for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I can promise you that. As a matter of fact, today, in the East Atrium, here on the Klein campus and up in the woodlands on the other side of the curtain, we've got tables set up. And at each one of those tables are individuals who believe in the mission ministry of Faith Bridge. And today is your opportunity as you leave to go by those tables and to find out what we're doing and what you can be doing. There's printed information, and there are persons there to answer your questions. Whether you want to go on a mission trip overseas, and we've got every single one of them out there, every trip that we're going on, or if you want to do mission right here in Houston, there's a table for that as well. For some of you, the only thing that stands between you and walking in obedience to Jesus is a 50-foot walk to the atrium or the other side of the curtain in the woodlands. And today, I'm inviting you as your mission's pastor to step up and remember, yes, this is who I am. And this is what God has called me to do. And I'm going to go find out what I can do. One more group of people that are here this morning. I imagine right about now you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, Pastor Dan, good and fine. Easy for you to say, you're the missions pastor. Of course, you've got time to go and do these things. But you know, uh, I'm not a pastor. I've got a real job. <laughs> real responsibilities, a family to look after, things that require my time. Uh, you just don't know what it's like on this side of the pulpit. Well... Maybe I don't know exactly what it's like to live your life. But I want you to hear from somebody who does. Somebody who sits out there with you week after week, whose life is plenty busy. Filled with work and family, lots of things. And yet, found the time to remember who he was and what God had called him to do. Take a listen. So my name is Justin Riley, and we've been going to Faith Bridge for a little over four years now. I was at a point in my career where work was going very well. We had kids, but I felt there was a, a void in my, my purpose. And being in the corporate world, it's difficult to bring up uh, God on a regular basis and open up the doors to conversations about God in the workplace. I had been praying for several years about going on some type of mission trip, uh, but I'm married, I have kids, so we prayed about the timing of it, and that's when re God really revealed that it was, it was black and white, that no, you, this is the time that you need to go. So in 2014, I went on a living water trip to Haiti. It was so easy to do here at Faith Ridge. There was, there's multiple different opportunities and trips that are planned out. Um, there's longer trips, there's shorter trips. There's multiple meetings and the leaders of the trips do a fantastic job of preparing you for both the expectation of what, it, what you're going to do and then also the objectives of the mission trip. Prior to the meeting, I, I knew nothing about drilling a water well, but there's multiple meetings that you'll have leading up to the event where you'll have time to, to get to know everyone that's going to be on the trip. Also the culture that you're going into and the expectation of uh, who you're going to be working with. The objective of the trip is to share the gospel, it's not just to go and drill a water well. So there was an interaction uh, with the employees of Living Water that you're helping out and then also the community of, that, you're, that you're working in. Leading up to the trip, I would let people know that I was going to be gone at work because I was going to Haiti. So just by going on the trip and having conversations about going to Haiti, it brought God into the workplace. So it was really an answer of prayer to me where I saw what I felt God was telling me is, I can use you where you're at. And I really think that that mission trip was the defining moment and helped me experience um, the impact of bringing God to the workplace. And it was a non-intrusive way 
to bring up God's Word with customers, with coworkers, with employees. The reason that we're on mission is to make an impact on people's lives and share the love of Jesus. Now, we will be impacted by our trip, but the whole objective of going on the trip is to imp impact the lives of others. We asked Justin to speak uh, on the video. He was reluctant. He said, you know, Dan, I'm nothing special about me. I'm no different from anyone else. And I said, oh, yeah, you are. You're different in that you're doing it. You've remembered who you are, and you've remembered what you're supposed to be doing. Right outside the doors of Faith Bridge right now is a broken, godless, chaotic world in desperate need of the good news of the gospel. And I would think that that fact alone right there would be motivation enough for us to find our place of service. But let me share with you one other reason, which I think is even more compelling, about why we should never forget who we are and never forget what we're supposed to be doing. And that reason is this. Jesus never, ever forgot about us. Despite the fact that we had turned our backs on Him and walked away into sin and rebellion, walked into darkness, Jesus went on a mission trip to earth to find you and me and to bring us into the light. Knowing that it would cost Him a broken body, knowing full well that He would shed His blood that we might have life. Today we are going to remember what Jesus did for us, that He never forgot us. We're going to gather at His table. And as you come to His table today, I, I want to challenge you to come with your heart, your mind, your ears wide open so that you might hear what God has to say to you today the reminder that he wants to give to you so that when you leave today, you leave knowing this is what he wants you to do. As you come forward in all of our locations, the ushers will be guiding everyone to the front. We have several stations here, and at each station we have gluten-free crackers and grape juice. As you come forward, you can take a cracker, dip it in the juice, and then partake. Following that, you are welcome to stay and pray at the altar. If you need someone to pray with you, raise your hand and someone, uh, one of our prayer partners in a red shirt, will be glad to come alongside and pray with you. Here at Faith Bridge, we have an open table. That is to say, anyone who has a relationship with Jesus or would like to have one with him is welcome to come. I don't think it's an accident that you are here today. And I think God has a reminder for each and every one of us, not only about who we are, but about what it is He wants us to be doing. As you come, be ready to receive that. Let me pray for us. Father, I confess to you that uh, just like anyone else, I am capable of forgetting who I am in Jesus and that I can get so preoccupied with my job and my priorities that I forget you have a task for me to do. I pray for myself and for all those here who can relate to that, that you would give us forgiveness today, that you would cleanse us, renew us at your table. And as we partake of your body and your blood, we pray that they would empower us to be your presence in this dark, dark world. That they would give us courage to go forth and be and do all that you've called us to be and do. And it's in Jesus' name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre, and I am joined by Pastor Dan Slagle, who just finished up our series called Rise Above. Pastor Dan, thank you so much for being here with us sure. today. Glad we to. had a few questions uh, come in, and so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, the first question was in reference to Second or First Peter 2.12, mm -hmm. um, and they want to know how is it that when we are doing our good deeds, mm -hmm. um, that we make sure that it's mm -hmm. God that gets the glory and honor for it and that people don't praise us or honor us for doing those good deeds. And then they also want to know uh, what was the day that Peter was referring to in that verse? Okay. Well, how does God get the glory? Um, let me uh, <clears throat> first suggest some ways to not go about that. <laughs> I don't think it would be helpful to overtly point out that the only reason I'm doing this good thing is for God sure. or, or to draw that straight line every time. Right. But neither would I run away from uh, a softball that comes my way to right. easily connect it with God. I think the most effective way is simply to be uh, genuinely good, mm -hmm. uh, authentically kind, whatever the situation calls for. That has a curiosity all its own. Uh, and over time, eventually, someone's going to ask, right. why are you the way you are? What is right. it that's different about you? And when that window is open, then step right through it and give God the glory. Absolutely. Yeah, people should see the humanity that the church offers and, uh, and the goodness. Just the, very, the church's very existence should be a... A witness. A sign, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A witness yeah. to the reason why we're here. Exactly. Ab absolutely. And the day that Peter was referring to in that verse. Um, right. Um, the day. That, that is a common phrase in Scripture uh, that refers to the day of the Lord's return. Right. Uh, scripture is clear that at some point in time, Jesus will return bodily to earth. Don't know when that is, right. uh, but uh, that, that's the day that Peter is referring to. Right. And even Peter, they were thinking it could be tomorrow. Yes. They had no idea. And 2,000 years later, it still Here could be tomorrow. Are. Yeah. Yep. You never know. Uh, and then uh, our next question came from one of our small group leaders, actually. Mm -hmm. And they were wondering, uh, they had taken a, like a leadership test a, or a spiritual gifts discernment test, okay. trying to discern uh, everybody's gifts within the group. And some people within the group, they... Uh, they scored low on missions. And okay. so they were convinced that maybe mission trips just aren't for me. Maybe that's for other Christians, but maybe not for me. And so the question is, how can we um, show them mm -hmm. that despite maybe missions being low on their, in their gifts tests, that sure. missions are for everyone. We are all called to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. What's a loving way that we can convince them that that's true? Yeah. Well, I, I think um, one thing to point out is that <clears throat> A mission trip is not a spiritual gift. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you won't find that on any spiritual gift inventory. And uh, we need to educate people what exactly goes on mm -hmm. on a given mission trip. Sure. Not all of them are overtly evangelistic. Right. Sure, all of them go with the intention and the hope of an opportunity to share the gospel but some of them are focused on drilling a well, right. and you don't need to be an evangelist to do that. Yeah. Some are focused on building a house, mm -hmm. teaching, medical missions. Uh, there, there's a wide variety of opportunities to serve that require all sorts of giftings. Absolutely. So the trip itself really is not the issue. The issue is the purpose of a given trip. Mm -hmm. And do the gifts that God has given me, which I exercise here, in this part of the world with this body of Christ, do they translate to another part of the world with another part of the body of right. Christ? And I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time, yes. <laughs> there is yeah. no spiritual gift that anyone can hide behind and say, uh, sorry, I'm excluded because I don't have that particular gift. Uh, right. Trips are irrespective of Absolutely. gifts. Yeah, our gifts are not meant to be hoarded for right. ourselves, they're meant to be shared yeah. uh, with others and hopefully to lead others to 
yeah. to Christ. Well, Pastor Dan, thank you so much sure, for being with, here, being with us this morning. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next time. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.